nature, ah, I think just disappeared on me. We'll try that again. I just you, yeah, something loaded and then <laughs> my, my talk disappeared. But that's okay, we'll catch up. So anyway, I'm introducing Dawn Wilson and she's a professional nature and landscape photographer as well as an educator. And I have a lot to tell you about her because she's a pretty amazing lady. She began taking pictures and being around animals as a young child. But when she moved from New, New Jersey to Colorado in 2002, she was so inspired by the area that she decided to document and tell stories photographically and in writing of the beautiful wildlife and landscapes around her, which is in the Rocky Mountains. Dawn did a few stints in college and she came away with a communication degree from Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey, an MBA in marketing from Temple University and completed a computer graphics program at excuse me, the University of Arts in Philadelphia. She's also participated in many lectures, classes, and workshops to keep improving her skills as a photographer and as a naturalist. And besides taking and selling her photographs, Dawn also teaches photography classes. She gives workshops, offers private instruction, and leads tours as well. And to learn about the different topics she teaches and places she leads tours, Check out her webpage and Facebook page. The links are we've put in the chat. Dawn also loves the cold, unlike probably most of us, and the animals <laughs> and the animals that inhabit that world of high altitude and high latitude. And tonight she will introduce us to some of her favorites. As a naturalist, she will also share with us how knowledge of a subject's behavior, as well as awareness of the light source and background elements will help us improve our images. She will also discuss the gear that she uses to capture her beautiful photographs. Of Dawn's many talents, writing and sharing her knowledge and pictures is clearly demonstrated in the more than 600 bylines she has had in numerous magazines, books, and calendars, including Outdoor Photographer, Colorado Outdoors, Colorado Life, Wyoming Wildlife, National Geographic Digital, and Alaska Magazine. And those are just a few of them. She has been president of NANPA, which is North American Nature Photography Association. It's extremely well known. And she was president there for two terms and currently sits on their board and continues to volunteer for them. And if that isn't enough, Dawn also volunteers as a master naturalist with the city of Fort Collins Natural Areas. So she is going to be our presenter tonight, but I just want to give you a few quick instructions for tonight. Our procedure will be the following. When Dawn's presentation begins, we will all turn off the sound. So you turn off your own or we'll turn it off for you. Um, so we don't hear any uncensored conversations or TVs. And we'd also appreciate it if you would all turn off your video, which can also be a distraction during the presentation. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Now, tonight we will be saving all the questions to be answered at the end. I also want to express a huge thank you from all of us to Hunt's photo and video, which is represented by Noah and Gary, who have been responsible for connecting us and sponsoring the outstanding presenters we have scheduled this season. And finally, here is Dawn, our presenter tonight. Okay, Dawn, you have the floor. Okay, so let me share my screen here. Can everybody, can you see that, Nancy? Yeah, we just, that's it. You Perfect. got it. Perfect. All right. So we are, um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for all that. It wears me out thinking about all the things <laughs> you talk about. Me like, too. Oh, I, I need to get some more sleep, I think. Um, <laughs> So we're going to talk about how to get started in wildlife photography. I am assuming that um, in addition to being interested in birds, there's probably quite a few photographers in this group. Um, the, the two seem to go hand in hand very often. So we are going to, let me move this off to the side here. Um, we are going to 
kind of go through, I, I, I mixed up the presentation to kind of talk, you know, make sure there's some, some bird content in here, but as well as some of the things that I'm most familiar with, with which does tend to be uh, wildlife of Colorado, Wyoming, and Alaska, um, as well as Louisiana. Louisiana, I've um, been spending quite a bit of time there over the years. So a little bit, of, um, so Nancy gave a little bit of a background already about me. I am a native of New Jersey. I grew up there and then moved to Colorado in 2002 after I visited for the first time in 1997. And like most people fell in love with the state and said I was gonna live here. Um, I do have a communications degree for my undergraduate and MBA in marketing, which has become very, very helpful in running my business. And, but I did spend 20 years in corporate marketing before I had a really difficult personal year um, for several different reasons and decided that I wanted to pursue my passions versus sitting in a cubicle um, for the rest of my career. So it's been, there certainly has been things that I've given up to do that, but in the long run, I definitely am a lot happier and just super excited. This morning I was out, I'm working on an article about um, winter activities in state parks in Colorado. And I was up in a state park this morning in Northern Colorado that had, they get about, I think he said 300 inches of snow a year and it was absolutely gorgeous up there. And I drove past this one ranch and it looked like it was horses out there feeding or horses and cows feeding on some, um, some hay that, was, that had been dropped out there for them. And as I'm driving by, I realized there was antlers and some of the ho horses. So, so I went back and it turned out to be a mix of elk, elk, horses and cows out there. And it's just, you know, wow. it, it just remind, reminds me just how much I, I absolutely love what I'm doing. So, um, but I do specialize in wildlife for high altitudes and high latitudes. Um, you know, it's, it's easiest just to photograph what's in our backyard and what we have in our backyard is what we tend to know best. Um, so for me, wildlife photography was a way, part of the reason I came to Colorado that first time in 97 was I was actually looking at going to vet school. I knew I didn't want to stay, stay in a corporate office type job. I had always wanted to be a veterinarian. I always enjoyed being around animals. I always enjoyed science. Um, but this wound up being a way for me to kind of combine all those interests, the, the interest of the outdoors and science and nature and animals, as well as my marketing and my business and my writing skills, and my photography skills, it, it, it kind of all melded together into a really, really nice career. Um, but what I did find, and I always recommend this to people that as you get into photography, a lot of people try to do everything. They try a little bit of architecture. They try a little bit of portrait photography. They try landscape. They might dabble in macro photography, all kinds of different things. There's so many different options out there these days. But what winds up happening is that you really don't master any of it. You tend to get yourself very spread out very thin. Um, so you, get, you might get good at all of it or uh, several different types of photography. But what I found was that I, I took a step back from my photography around that time, you know, 2000, early 2010, 2011, and said, you know, what is it that I really want to focus my, my work on? And I really came back to the wildlife aspect of it. Now, I do, because I live in, in Colorado, I do a lot of, and I write for the newspaper, Nesta's Park, I do a lot of documentary photography, and I do a lot of landscape photography as well. But I always try to find some way to combine the wildlife into the landscapes if I can. Um, so in summary, I am a professional. I do this full time. Um, I do a lot of writing. I would say actually more, I actually make more money in my business on writing than I do as in photography, but it's a great way to combine the two skills, skill sets. A lot of people don't have both aspects of that. Um, so these are, you know, this is um, one of the covers that I have for Colorado Outdoors. This Caracaro is actually at a photo shoot down in Florida. Um, a really beautiful day with a really distant background. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how to get those nice, clean, um, real soft, soft backgrounds. Um, bears are a favorite of mine. I do go up to um, Churchill in Alaska each year to photograph brown bears and polar bears. Um, so photography is, is the capture of reflected light on light sensitive medium, and whether that's film, paper, or pixels. So that's a technical term for it. Um, to me, photography really has two sides to it. There's a technical side, which is the, the, the equipment, the engineering aspects of, and the physic, physics that are involved in how cameras work. And then there's a creative side to it. And we're gonna talk probably a little bit more about the creative side tonight, um, because delving into the technical side is not the most exciting uh, presentation, as well as there's so much equipment out there these days. 
Um, and it changes a lot. It changes, it's constantly changing. So basically, uh, photography is drawing with light. It's basically the study of light. And you use it to tell memories. Um, you can you know, publish it in magazines and books. This is another cover. This is actually me. This is my first modeling job. Um, this is a self-portrait. I actually set up my tripod. This is a, um, a hike up to Dream Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park. And I went up there right after a fresh snowfall and, and broke trail. Um, and it wound up being a friend of mine actually said, I was at the press run for the magazine and you'll never guess what, who's on the cover of it. So um, cameras do come in all shapes and sizes. You know, these are the, the old original types of cameras where you would look down into the mirror and then you would see the reflected image. Um, it would actually be backwards point and shoots. So this is the evolution of cameras. Um, this bottom right hand one is what I'm currently using. This is a Nikon Z9. Um, it's a mirrorless camera. Um, cell phones are certainly a big aspect of taking photography, taking photographs these days. So taking a photograph and, and the one point I wanted to, 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 to mention with the different types of cameras, whether you're using a cell phone, a mirrorless, um, you know, a DSLR, a film camera, any of these techniques from a creative aspect actually work on any of those. So even if you're using your cell phone, keep these kinds of concepts in mind when it comes to composition and how you frame your subject. Um, so when you're taking your photograph, you wanna select your subject, obviously. Um, you know, what do you wanna photograph? I always try to make a point that when I go out for the day, I have, kind of, I have in my mind what my goals are. I try not to get myself sidetracked. Like this morning, I got sidetracked with the elk. Um, that was a, a pretty special opportunity. Um, but I really go out with, with a goal in mind. Like I might go out to photograph American dippers. I have a, um, a dipper project that I'm working on right now to document them throughout the year. I might go out and say, you know what, today is going to be a bighorn sheep day, or it's snowing and I want to photograph elk in the snow. So I always try to give myself a, a goal for the day. But of course, you certainly have to be flexible for some of the things that kind of pop up and you know, cross your path. And then select your location relative to your subject. So for example, if I want to go and photograph dippers, um, I know they are always going to be near water, which means I need to um, kind of cruise you know, a stream or a river looking, looking for them um, where they would be feeding. I wouldn't wanna look for a dipper along the edge of a lake per se. Not that they, I haven't seen them at, at lakes, but I wouldn't wanna look for them in a meadow. They wouldn't be in a meadow. They're, they're always gonna be by water. So you wanna have some understanding of what your subject does, their behaviors, uh, what do they like to eat? What do they like to do? What time of year is it? What type of activity are they involved in? Is it nesting season? Is it mating season? Is it fledging season? season. Um, and then you want to consider your lighting. So the time of day, the weather, and whether you want to use a flash. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, consider the background. So we're kind of narrowing things down a little bit here. So now you've got your subject, you've, you've driven out to the location where you want to photograph them. Now you need to find, once you find your subject, um, you want to think about what does the background look behind them. So for example, with this cedar wax wing, this was, I was mentioning it to Nancy and Mary earlier, this is actually in a Walmart parking lot. Um, there's a busy road behind, these are um, shrubs that were actually um, ornamental landscaping shrubs. I don't know what kind they were, um, but the, the wax wings were loving the berries that were on them. They cleaned them out in about four or five days. Um, but there's actually a road behind these series of bushes. So I had to wait to make sure that I wasn't photographing like a big white truck going behind it. And that would be kind of distracting. Um, there were a couple of buildings on the far side of the road that had a nice tan color, but I always positioned myself to make sure that I wasn't getting, there's a McDonald's off to the right-hand side. I didn't want to have a, you know, a big yellow set of arches in there, that kind of thing. So you always want to think about what's in the background. Your background is, is just as important as what your subject um, in photographing your subject. So think about those types of things. Um, select a stable position. You want to use a tripod, a beanbag, or a monopod. Um, for this situation with the wax wing, I was photographing from the car using the car as a blind. So I was using a beanbag on the window. Um, and when I mean a beanbag, it's actually a, the one I use is called a skimmer sack. It's actually designed for photography. It's a canvas bag and it's, it kind of hangs over the door. And I fill mine with, I think it has sunflower seeds in it right now. Um, I do not recommend using bird seed. The little mullen seeds will get everywhere. Um, some people use um, corn hulls, the, the, like just the, the husk part, because it's super light. 
and that works really well too. Um, these days I'm using the, using the bean bag probably the most and hand holding a lot. Um, I use tripods in a situation where if I'm waiting for something to happen, I don't wanna hold my camera. Um, the tripod allows me to just kind of leave the camera in position where I don't have to hold it the whole time. And I do have a monopod as well. Monopods work really well for situations where either you don't have the space to put a tripod up or especially for birds, I find a monopod can work really well because I don't wanna deal with opening up the legs of a tripod, which can, which means that sometimes I can lose some time um, and miss a shot in, in getting myself set up. And then you can also rest on top of a, a rock or a fence post if, if you don't have anything else with you and you happen to see something that you, that you really wanna photograph. And then when you're taking your photo, make sure you just um, either hold the shutter button down. I mean, these days that Z9 that I have has a frame rate of 20 frames per second, which um, I have to be really careful about what I wind up with at the end of the day. But the that frame rate, however, if I'm trying to get a bird in flight, I can get a, a really good series um, and be real selective on which frame I wanna use. Um, but you don't wanna tap it. You don't wanna keep tapping it. One, because you could potentially lose your focus. Um, your camera could refocus on whatever's going on in the background, depending upon how you have your camera set up. And then it could also um, shake the camera. The more you, you tap the, every time you tap the camera, it may not seem like a lot, but that could give you a little bit of movement. So if you're in a situation where you're in a low light situation where you don't have a very fast shutter speed, that could move the camera and that'll also cause your subject not to be sharp. So when you're taking your photograph, this is what you wanna think about. This is what I call the triangle of light. Um, and there's three ways when you're taking a photograph that you can adjust the light. So we mentioned earlier that photography is the study of light. Um, and these are the three ways that you adjust it. You adjust it by the ISO, you adjust it by the shutter, and you adjust it by the aperture. To me, ISO is the quality of the photograph. The higher the ISO goes, the more light you get, but the higher it goes, you also get more noise introduced into the, that frame. Um, these days, there's some software out there. I use um, Topaz Denoise, which is a phenomenal software to reduce the ISO or the, reduce the noise that's in a photograph. Um, cameras, newer cameras also do really well with higher ISO. So this isn't as big of an issue, but there was a time in film days, especially in you know, early, early um, time of cameras that you would actually, I mean, it could be so grainy. Um, but if you, if that's all that was available, that's what you use. So today that's not as much of an issue. So the higher the ISO, the more light you get in your frame or in your photographs. The shutter speed is what we use to freeze the action, freeze or slow the action. With birds, it can be a lot of fun to actually photograph them blurred out as they're flying, like snow geese taking off or a flock of wax wings taking off. Um, so you want to use a slower shutter speed for that, and then you would need to adjust the other two so that you're properly exposed. Um, again, if you want to freeze the action, then you would um, speed up your shutter. And with um, birds in particular, or anything that moves really fast, at a minimum, you really want to have about one one thousandth of a second um, to get that to freeze that action. With birds, especially smaller birds, it, it's probably closer to about two one two thousandth of a second. And so again, by speeding up the, the shutter speed, that means you're reducing the amount of light that's hitting the sensor. So you need to go back to the ISO and the aperture to adjust those to allow more light in for a proper exposure. And then the same thing with aperture. Aperture to me is um, probably of the three, the most gives you the most creativity, I think. Um, this is where you can really blur out the background. It gives you that depth of field. It allows you to have everything tack sharp in a landscape photo. Um, you, know, you can get really cool images with, if you're doing um, macro photography and use a wide open aperture, you can really focus in on just certain, certain aspects of, a, of an animal or a plant or a flower or something. But again, the wider the aperture, the more light that goes in, and then you need to adjust the ISO and the shutter speed. So depending upon what I, I photograph in manual mode so that I can control all three of these at the same time. Um, on occasion, I do go to a automatic ISO setting where the camera selects it. And the only time I do that is if, for example, if, if I'm photographing a bird that's kind of in dappled light or it's kind of coming in and out of shadows, let's say it, you know, like a, a spoonbill at a rookery where you, you know, it might be flying in and out of shadows um, from the branches. I might go to an auto ISO that it'll automatically adjust some of that. 
I have had over the years challenges with, um, especially um, on a bright sunny day, if there's shadows and then the bird flies into, um, or any animal, um, your bighorn sheep or elk, um, sometimes I have challenges with because they have they have white butts. Um, so they, they, if the camera is getting an exposure reading, a light exposure reading on the side of the animal, let's say an elk that's brown, dark brown, um, then that white butt's going to be overexposed. So I really try to shoot in manual um, so that I can kind of control all of those things with the shutter or the aperture being what I'm going after, depending upon what my goal is for that photo. And then I use ISO as the third item for adjusting that light. So the rule of thirds is another aspect that when you're out taking photographs of animals, think about this. Um, there's actually, it's called the golden rule where our brains actually like things to be positioned in these crosshair points. So where this duck is in this, where these four points are, think of it like a tic-tac-toe, but where these lines cross, in these four points is where you want to position your subject. And that basically becomes that golden rule where our brain feels that's more dynamic. Um, if an animal or your subject is positioned right in the middle of the, of the frame, um, it becomes stagnant. It, it loses the moving around in the frame. It, it, this gives the viewer some movement into looking at it. It gives the duck some movement to move into the frame. So, it allows it to be much more dynamic and therefore a much more pleasing photo for, for unconsciously for our brains to like. So depth of field, I've mentioned this a couple of times already. Um, the depth of field is, is something you control with the aperture. So, um, you know, if you don't want everything in focus, so like on these piano keys, this key here is what's tack sharp and everything else blurs out into the back and into the foreground. So this is a very creative style. If you want that shallow depth of field, and that's what this is called, um, you get you can achieve that with a wide open aperture like f4, f6, 3. This is what you would usually, this is the type of setting you would usually photograph for like a, a portrait. Um, there was that photograph I had at the beginning with the, well, the waxwing, the cedar waxwing. There was a, um, there was another one towards the beginning where it was a nice clean background a real nice soft, oh, with the Cara Cara, with that nice green background. That was probably photographed. I like the, I like on my cameras, I like 6.3. Um, that tends to be my go-to one to start with. Um, F4 can really soften things out. If you wanna have everything tack sharp, then you wanna go into a smaller aperture and that would be like F16, F22, F32. And those are the types of things that you use for things like landscape photography, where you wanna have everything tack sharp within that photograph. So here's some ideas for when you do go out to the field, um, kind of think of, you know, if, you know, get your, the obvious images, um, the things that you said, all right, I'm gonna go out and photograph a great blue heron today. I wanna photograph a great blue heron sitting in a marsh. I wanna photograph a great blue heron fishing. I wanna photograph a great blue heron flying. Um, this, was, this was a great blue heron. This is down on Lake Pontchartrain and one of the marshes along the edge of Lake, northern edge of Lake Pontchartrain at sunset. I'm a, I am a sucker for backlight and silhouette. So I silhouetted this guy out. And I took my original photograph was this frame here, this third one down. And I was like, you know what? This sky is really pretty. So I actually created a, a vertical, this is called a vertical panoramic. Um, so this is actually four images stitched together. So there's one, two, three, and four. Um, so I took four horizontal images and then stitched them together in Lightroom. So these are just some ideas for you, you know, to kind of get something a little bit different once you get the, the things that you go out for in the field. Again, this is a horizontal panoramic. This is a herd of elk. You can see there's a coyote in here. This was calving season. Um, you can see this little calf over here. And this is a behavior that um, I've seen, but I've never really had a, a good opportunity to photograph it. Um, this was actually the day, this was in 2020, the day the park, Rocky Mountain National Park opened up after it was being, after it was closed for COVID. Um, and there was a coyote den fairly close to the road. They had 13 pups that year. Obviously nobody was in the park. so. I guess they um, took advantage of, of having a nice quiet area for themselves for a while. Um, but the day that it opened, this, this coyote pack was actually trying to go after the calves. And elk, like many cervids, 
um, and ungulates will actually herd around their, their young to protect them from predators. And that's exactly what was being photographed here. Um, but it is a, a, a horizontal panoramic versus the vertical panoramic in the previous image. So something else, this is high dynamic range is used probably a little bit more for um, landscape photography when you have something that's in a still position. Obviously with wildlife, usually wildlife is, is moving. Um, so it's a little bit harder to do with wildlife. But high dynamic range is short for, um, I'm sorry, HDR is high dynamic range. It stands for high dynamic range. And basically what you're doing is a series of photos at different exposure levels. So you wanna take one exposure for the shadows, one exposure for the midtones, and one exposure for the highlights. So here in this photo, the shadows, this photo on the right-hand side, the shadows are extremely dark. This is actually um, overall a very dark photo, but what it has is properly expo exposed clouds. So this photo in general is difficult because there's a lot of shadows and a lot of highlights in those clouds. So by taking a combination of different exposures, you can then blend them together in Lightroom um, fairly easily these days. And it'll actually come out with a properly exposed image that now is, has, doesn't, has properly exposed clouds that aren't overexposed. You never wanna have um, pure white in your photographs. And I don't go too much into histograms in this um, in this presentation, but that's something that you should look at using on your, your cameras. Um, look at the histogram. You wanna make sure that you don't overexpose or blow what they call blow out the highlights and the whites because that'll just print in this odd white shape. And you wanna make sure your shadows aren't too dark. So there is still some detail left in here in these, um, in these aspen trees and pine trees in the left-hand side. So, so that's the concept and you don't have to do three, you can actually do five or seven. If it's a really contrasty scene where you have a lot of really deep shadows and a lot of highlights, like right now in Colorado we have, because we have so much snow on the ground, um, that's actually a, a situation that comes up pretty frequently in the winter time. So I'll actually go to, go to five frames and that will help um, to just give me a little bit more of those exposures in there for just a much betterly, uh, betterly, that's not even a word, um, for, um, much better exposure um, for the final image. Macro photography is a fun thing to do. Um, one thing that I use it a lot for are things that I might find that represent animals. So things like a feather that I might find on the ground, or I've done things where I have found um, skeletons on the ground or a skull, and I'll do really abstract taking a really um, wide open aperture so that I can just focus in on one aspect of the, you know, let's say it's a skull, one aspect of that skull, and then the rest of it kind of gets blurred out. For something that you, for macro photography, that represents a one-to-one -one ratio, that you're getting a true 100% or larger um, representation of your subject. And to do that, you want to have that really stop down, that really small aperture, so you get that deep depth of field and you get all of the detail in it. So if you ever see, um, there's a, you can do a whole presentation on macro photography where, you know, there are people out there that do ice bubbles and they might do um, snowflakes, they do flowers and they do all these stacked, um, stacked focal planes. At, with a macro lens and they blend them all together to get a, a super tack sharp image. It's really pretty interesting some of the things they can do. But that's another way that you can, um, when you go out to the field. Again, just, just some different ideas before we kind of get into some of the, the deeper stuff with um, wildlife and landscapes. So um, landscape photography, again, you wanna have the depth of field so the, so the photo is sharp throughout. So there's the elk here in the foreground are tack sharp all the way back to the mountains in the background which are several miles away are tack sharp. Um, I love using this for envi environmental portraits. Um, you know, in Colorado where we have these huge wide open scenes, I just love showing an animal where it's living. Um, this is up on the tundra in Rocky Mountain National Park. It was photographed at F-16, which for landscapes it tends to be my go-to on that end of the spectrum. Um, so I mentioned, I, I tend to go to for wildlife and portraits, I tend to go to the F-6-3 for landscapes, environmental portraits. I go to, I start with a F-16 that for my camera gear that gives me the best sharpness throughout the frame. This is 
what I would still consider an environmental portrait, um, but I've actually gone to an F5.6 for a couple of reasons. One, I needed the light. You can see it's snowing. It's a dark gray, cloudy day. Um, that allowed to have more light in the frame so I could have it properly exposed. But what it also did is that you can still see that there are trees back here, but now it's softened that background out. It's given a lot of negative space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of work um, editorial type work, whether it's for magazines or newspapers, um, where they may want to have some negative space. And this is one of the, the ways that I achieve that. So this is, it still tells the story, but it's not so distracting that it would be really easy to put text over this or maybe an overlay another image on it or some graphics or something. So that works really well for editorial purposes. But that was the goal. This is the, this is what's tax sharp. Um, this is where I focus, but by having the five, six, that background is really nice and soft. Portraits. So again, we talked about, um, you want to have that wide open aperture, the five, six, six, three, so that you can create this nice soft green background. Um, what you do, what I've included these two in here, these two images in here for, these are both photographed at F8, is that you also need to consider how close you are to your subject. Um, this is a full frame shot of this bald eagle. The, the beak on it is slightly soft, but because I was so close to him and I was photographing with a 500 millimeter lens, I needed to have an F8 so that I can make sure that the eyes are tack sharp, the feathers are tack sharp. This little bit of detail around its beak is, is tack sharp. If I wanted the whole end of the beak to be in focus, I probably would have to go up to like an F16 on it. What I would lose then, however, is some of this softness in the background. So that was why my choice was at F8 rather than F5.6, or um, yeah, F5.6. Same thing here with this fox. You can see the end of the nose is tack sharp, the ear is tack sharp, the eye is tack sharp. Um, this, I'm starting to lose a little bit of the sharpness on this back eye, which is okay. But I wanted to blur out this, I wanted to frame the, the face against the fur. Um, so again, to do that, I need to create that wider app that you know, wider aperture so that um, that blurs it blurs this out. I lose some of the detail in here, and the detail all goes to the eye and to the nose and the face. So psychologically, our in photographs, the eye always goes to the sharpest over the softer and the brighter over the darker within an image. So your eye is drawn first to, to the top of the head on this bald eagle, um, and then to the eyes because those, that's what's tack sharp here. Your eye is drawn first to this tack sharp here because this is all softened out in the background. So again, some little things to consider when you're out in the field photographing. Action photography. This is where you go back to, you have to make the shutter the priority versus the aperture the priority. Um, with wildlife photography, I would say this is probably the most desired type of image. People love to see birds in flight. They love to see animals running, snow, you know, kicking up snow. Um, you might want to see you know, bull elk sparring, or you might want to see bighorn rams butting heads, you know, all those different types of things. And you have to have a fast shutter speed to capture that unless your purpose is to have a blurred, you know, a blurred action. But majority of the time you want to have a fast shutter speed so that you can freeze these bald eagles flying in. You can freeze a bird flying past. You can freeze a bird flying into a nest. Um, so you wanna get as fast of a shutter as your light will allow. So going back to the triangle of light, you know, get a high, a really fast shutter speed and then adjust your aperture and ISO to get the right exposure with the light. Again, birds in flight, this is, um, this loggerhead shrike, I had been watching it for a while and I had seen it kept coming into this. These are, um, I believe this is a wax current bush and it would fly in and then it would go off and eat and it would come back. So I pre-focused on these branches here. Um, this is an F6.3, you can see it's at 25 hundredths of a second. So a really a pretty fast shutter speed and just kept waiting um, You know, as it would fly in rather than tracking with it. I would keep my focal point on the where I wanted to photograph the action. So this is a pretty common technique um, with birds that you want to, you know, watch them for a little while rather than actually photograph them, watch them, see, do they have a favorite perch? Do they have a favorite hole that they're going in and out of? Um, when it's nesting season, try to find where that nest is and pre-focus on the nest. 
um, so that you're not trying to track with the bird, but rather rather anticipate where the action's going to happen. And in the long run, those typically become better photos. So again, um, birds in flight depend on this. Oh, it does depend on the size of the bird too. So for example, this is one eight hundredth of a second on a bald eagle. Bald eagles are, and he was also taking off. So it, you know that's a little bit of a cheat there. That you know if if you see a bald eagle in water, you know eventually he's going to going to take off. I actually saw him. Um, he had pounced down on this fish, so I knew he was eventually going to fly off to eat it. Um, but bald eagles don't fly terribly fast. Um, you can see at 800th of a second, his wings are a little bit blurred, which I actually like. I think it shows that there's movement there, other than you can tell that, you know, he is midair, but it gives that sense of movement. But at 800th of a second, I can, I can pretty much freeze a bird like a, like a bald eagle. If I was photographing at 800th of a second with a swallow, however, it would be a blurred mess. Um, so this is at 1 2,000th of a second. And these have got to be one of the hardest birds to, to this is the one of the first things with the Z9 that I wanted to test, test its tracking capabilities with. And um, yeah, obviously I was, I was pretty happy with that. So, um, you know, the technology that's out there today certainly helps with it as well. In the plane of focus. So for example, if you have a nest, a nest cavity and you're pre-focusing on the nest cavity, See which direction the bird is coming in. Sometimes they might come in from the back a little bit. Sometimes they'll come in directly into the side. Um, usually that's what I find is that they'll, you know, wherever the cavity is, they kind of come in directly. They don't kind of swing around. But if you give yourself an F8, F9, F10, you actually open up that plane of focus and you have a better chance of getting that bird sharp if it's not exactly flying in straight at the nest. Now we're gonna try, this is a little short video. Um, it doesn't always, um, over the internet, sometimes it can be a little bit choppy, but these are sage grouse. Um, I, you know, I, these days, you know, there's so many people out there taking photographs. Try to get some video too while you're out there. Um, bring your cell phone with you. Cell phones are great for capturing video. Um, the other thing too, is that when it, when the light is super low, but there's still activity happening, video can actually be a, a oops, can actually be a way to, um, to still use your time and, and capture something. So hopefully you get, if you haven't ever had a chance to see sage grouse out in the left during the mating season, that's coming up at the end of March and through April. It is so much fun to watch them, um, you know, out here in Colorado, Wyoming, um, or prairie chickens. Prairie chickens are really interesting to watch, or um, sharp-tailed grouse. But the sage grouse in particular, I think, are probably the most ornate of all of them. Um, another thing you can try when you're out photographing is, you know, get a fast shutter speed and photograph that flock taking off and freeze all the action. But then once you get a couple of good shots that way, um, slow your shutter speed down. Like this, I think, yeah, this one was at 1 15th of a second. This one's at 1 10th of a second. Um, and then you can get these more abstract and creative perspectives of that flock. Um, you know, it kind of shows the chaos a little bit more. Um, just to, again, just another, another thing that you can um, try. It gives you another thing, you know, when you're out there and you're photographing for an hour, two hours, um, it's just something else different to capture a different image. One of the things that I like about um, blurred images is I think it pulls out the color a little bit more. You can really see the blue and the tans here. Um, you can make out with these black skimmers, you can make out the little pops of orange on their bills. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that I really like about, um, about blurred images. And it's kind of the same thing too. You can use the same concept of a slow shutter speed and pan with an animal whether that's a running bighorn sheep or a bird in flight. If you have a slow shutter speed, um, properly exposed, so you're not overexposing it, pan with that animal right at about the same speed that they're flying and you can blur the background but freeze, um, freeze the action of the bird. You can also do that thing that with you know, people on bikes or with cars. Cars are actually a really good way to, to test that or to practice with it and improve that skill. 
So let's switch over to landscape images. Um, when you're photographing landscapes, one of the biggest things in addition to that rule of thirds that we talked about a little bit earlier, you wanna consider the foreground, midground, and background. So for example, in this photograph, this is Bierstadt Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park. The foreground is the grass and the reflection down here. Um, the midground is the lake, the trees, the forest, and the mountains in this middle section. And then the background is the clouds in the sky. So you always want to have those layers in there. And again, that helps with the viewer's perspective of the scene. It allows them to look at that photograph and kind of move their eyes through it. And it helps to tell that story. Every photo should include these elements, create a sense of balance. Um, and you can use things like a, a rock or a leading, leading line or a river. An animal works really well as something in the foreground to kind of get the viewer to start into the image. Um, this is another example where I have, there's a moose here with a reflection in this pond. So this is this, this is up on the tundra in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, this is a pond way up high on the tundra. This is the foreground element. You've got the mountains here that are the midground, and then again you have the sky with the clouds. So again, very consistent. You know, there's when you talk about the rule of thirds, you have one third is the sky, one third is the mountains, and one third here is the pond. The pond being pond with the moose being your foreground subject. And this is what I refer to as as an animal environmental portrait or an animal in the environment shot. Um, these are the ones that I am actually going after probably the most frequently. These are also probably the hardest to get. So you, this would be a pretty scene. Um, it wasn't quite, it was probably about you know, 30, 45 minutes after sunrise. So the light's still pretty nice. Um, but without the moose in there, it's kind of a pretty scene, but there's not really much going on. I love the story of, you know, you add that moose in there and she just kind of popped up. I was actually photographing there. Um, sometimes the, some wildflowers grow along, along the edge of this pond here. And as I was walking away, I happened to turn around and sure enough, uh, there's a moose walking right into the scene. And, you know, sometimes you, that, that's how environmental portraits kind of come about. Usually you wait, you see, um, you know, you might know, you know, the behavior of an animal, you know, they like a certain spot. Um, you might wait for something to happen and it might never materialize. A lot of times this is how it happens. It just kind of, you kind of stumble across it. You happen to be in the right spot at the right time. This is another environmental portrait. This is one that I was waiting for. Um, this is up on Mount Evans. This is Mount Bierstadt here on the upper left, um, a 14,000 foot mountain. Mount Evans is a 14,000 foot mountain. This is Abyss Lake down here below and the, this is at sunset. So I know that, um, and then these are Grays and Tories. These are two more 14,000 foot mountains. Um, so I know the sun sets back there. And on certain days when I'm up there, it's, you know, in the afternoon, I'll kind of keep an eye on the clouds. This down in here, so the behavior, we've talked a couple of times already about behavior with animals. If I want to photograph mountain goats in this scene, I happen to know that they, they spend the evenings down here. This is really rocky back in here. It's very steep. Predators can't get to them. So the nannies take the, the kids and they actually will take them down there at night and then they come back in the morning and then they come out and they feed. There's a couple of spots where you can find them during the day and then they migrate back there at night. And so that was exactly what I did as I was seeing this really pretty sunset, sunset potential. Um, and then we just waited. I waited to see if um, we would get some mountain goats in this area and sure enough, they, they kind of popped in there. So again, sometimes it's, you know, you just get lucky and, and things kind of come together. Other times you might have to kind of pre-visualize what you want to photograph and be there ready to photograph them. Um, this is a scene where it is photographed at F-16. To me, this is a landscape. This is still where my focal point is because this is where I wanna make sure that these goats are tack sharp, but it's F-16 so I can make sure that the mountains here in the background um, and the lake down here are still tack sharp as well. Um, depth of field. So think about the story you're trying to tell with a photograph. This image was photographed at F11, which is kind of like a mid-ground. It's not quite that wide open aperture and it's not a stop down aperture that you would use for landscape. But what I wanted to communicate in this photograph is the sharp and soft aspects of the swamp. Um, you know, you get these palmetto plants that have very sharp ends on their, on their leaves, yet this was a foggy morning. So I wanted to kind of 
emulate that within the photograph to give that soft feel. So I went with an F11 to really bring out the detail in the subjects here in the foreground, the fall colors on these different trees, um, you know, the palmettos, the sharpness of the palmettos, but then the, the depth of field really falls back and softens out back to where that fog is in there. So it really kind of gives, you know, again, it's almost like an environmental portrait, but this time the portraits of the palmetto within that scene of um, just that feel of the swamp, the heavy, thick air, the, you know, the warmth of the air, the colors that morning. Um, you know, so again, think of that, pre-visualize how you want that photograph to work rather than just taking a snapshot and just shooting away. Really think about how you can use the, the skills that you have, the compositional tools that you know, and then the, the um, settings within a camera that can actually help you communicate that. Um, focus tracking. So within your camera, um, birds in flight, this is a, a big one for any animal that's moving. There's two different settings that you can go with, whether you have Nikon or Canon, they call them slightly different. Um, you can go with Al Servo versus a single or a one shot. Um, Al Servo is what allows you to track. If you're photographing kids playing soccer, if you're photographing a basketball shooting, basketball player shooting, shooting into the hoop, if you're photographing a bird in flight, if you're photographing a fox kit running after um, a, you know, something that it just caught. Any of those things you wanna go with an Al Servo and that will allow you to track with it and the camera will, will help you or, or aid you in keeping, keeping the focus on it. Single shot, however, is going to just have that single point of focus. So you're gonna pick one point within your frame to say that, so like for example, this um, Sandhill Crane, I probably photographed this on a single, um, this one had been a single shot probably because I would have um, tracked with it. So I would have taken the focal point um, to make sure the bird was tack sharp and then tracked with it, keeping that focal point on the body itself. Um, by having, sometimes what happens is that if you have a busy background and a bird's flying by it and you're going with Al Servo, the camera will start to kind of struggle with, do you want me to photograph the background, which is stationary? It's a little easier for me to lock on the focus. Or are you trying to get me to photograph this um, animal that's moving? So a single shot will allow you to kind of help you move through them. When you're photographing, you want to make sure you're photographing, you're creating raw files. Um, so this is the, the quality setting of your files in your camera. JPEG is the option that you will use. Usually it's, it's the most common once the image is edited, um, but the raw file is what you wanna capture when you're out photographing. It provides the most detail and data in the file and therefore gives you the most opportunity to edit it, to make those um, dramatic changes. If you shoot in JPEGs, it kind of limits to what you can do. Um, there are different quality levels and you can do some things with it, but RAW is always going to give you the most, most variability in what you can do to that file. Um, RAW images are gonna be a little bit larger, which means you need to have faster cards and you also need to have um, cards that can hold more, more files. So you wanna have some larger cards. Shooting speed, so this goes back to the, the shutter speed. We've talked about this a little bit. You wanna have, um, you also want to make sure that you have a camera if you want to photograph wildlife make sure you have a camera that does a high frames per second i mentioned the nikon z9 is at 20 frames a second some cases i find that to be a little bit overkill i don't need to come home with a thousand photos of a of a bull elk standing there in a field um, whereas if i am photographing swallows as i mentioned earlier having that 20 frames a second really allows me to make sure that i'm getting the perfect wing position the perfect position of the eyes, the body, um, all those different things. It just gives me more frames to, to choose from. <clears throat> and for wildlife, you wanna set your, you can, most cameras can photograph in single, low frame rate or a high frame rate. And I always photograph in that high frame rate. Um, it just gives me, that's where it's at 20 frames a second. I'm not sure what the, the Z9 might be a, at the low, low frame rate, I'm gonna say probably, you know, let's say it's like 10, it's usually about half, or you can do in single. So single would be that no matter how long you hold the shutter button down, it will only take one frame. Whereas in the high frame rate, if you hold the shutter button down, it'll just keep going until it buffers out and it can't take any more photos. 
Um, single shot is one shot, and I just mentioned them. Um, and sometimes you just have to take advantage of what is given to you in the field. This was a situation I was out photographing. This is um, Caddo Lake. This is a swamp on the border of Texas and Louisiana. Um, I was photographing the fog that morning. Um, you know, some backlight coming in, some really pretty, I mean, the fog was just gorgeous that morning, super still in there. And all of a sudden these wood ducks um, swam by, started to swim by and didn't realize I was sitting there and took off. Um, so I had to real quickly switch to, I could only get, because of the low light, I got um, one three twentieths of a second. And that's why you can see like the wings are blurred in here. I what did manage to, to lock my focus on this bird um, and then F6, because I was already photographing the whole scene, I was at F16. So you have to be familiar with your camera. And obviously that just comes with practice, um, but be familiar with your camera so that when these types of situations come up, you can, you can take advantage of them. You can say, oh my gosh, I've got to focus on that duck um, because he's going to be gone in, in a matter of seconds. Lighting options, um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a sucker for backlight. This is a backlit situation down here at the Sandhill Cranes. This is in Nebraska during their migration. Um, this is nice soft light. So ideally I wanna be out during the golden hours. I, you know, that first hour of the morning, last hour of the day, that's when the light is lowest in the horizon um, and has to filter through the most um, dust and atmospheric conditions and therefore creates the, the softest, warmest light. Um, that's, that's calling it the golden hours. Outside of that, my second favorite would be thin clouds. And that's when this elk was photographed. Thin clouds can kind of, you know, it works almost like a scrim. Um, it filters the light out almost like a lampshade on a lamp, you know, it cuts that harsh light of looking right at the light bulb. Um, and then after that, I mean, it, I'm all about backlight. If I can find a backlight situation where the, the sunlight is behind an animal, um, where I'm not photographing, usually I'm not photographing directly into the sun, but um, but it might be low enough, you know, where it's just creating this rim lighting around elk when they still have velvet on their antlers, um, you know, rim lighting with hair on the back of an animal. Those types of situations just add a lot of drama to a photograph. The other nice thing about cloudy days or you know soft light light days is that it, it reduces the temperature usually. You guys are in Florida, so it's, it's certain times of the year it's gonna be hot no matter what the, the clouds are doing. Um, but a lot of times animals might be out longer on cloudy days too. Um, so front lighting is when the, the sun is behind you and lighting up the front of your subject um, kind of directly on, kind of like with this elk, you, know, you can see all the Actually, it might even be a little bit off to the side here, but um, that's when it fills in. And this is the most traditional. It gives a nice warm look to your subject. Uh, reflective lighting is like this um, junco in this tree is actually getting some reflective light. Again, it was kind of soft. It was a little bit cloudy. But what wound up happening is that this bird sitting in this tree with all these yellow leaves, the light was actually kind of bouncing off the leaves and creating this really nice soft light, almost almost kind of like shade, but not quite as harsh as, as shade. Um, so these are some nice situations to look for. And then this is that backlighting that I was talking about where the sun was setting behind this caribou and really illuminated the, all that velvet on his antlers and the edges of his hair. And you can see where it's coming through the beard, the light's coming through the beard here. Um, and that's where the light is in front of you and your subject is between you and, and the light. Um, this also helps on silhouettes too. So you can either create that backlighting situation or if you wanna create a silhouette, you really expose for the background and it'll make your subject um, turn, just kind of be a, a shadow. Um, and soft lighting, again, you know, I, you know, these kind of cloudy days, this is, um, you know, with a snowstorm, that, that cloudiness really kind of helps just give even light across your scene. Um, this raven was, this was right after um, it had rained in Yellowstone and that's why he was, he was cleaning up his feathers, trying to get the, the feathers kind of preened back out after the rain had kind of flattened them down a little bit, but that nice soft light gave nice even lighting across all of his feathers. And it also created, um, it really brought out some of the iridescence in the feathers of the raven too, which I liked. And then there's flash. I'm not a big user of flash. 
Um, I just find, I feel like it doesn't look natural to me. Um, I also am concerned that using flash disturbs animals more so than I would, would care to do. So I'm not a big fan. It's, it's not that I haven't. Um, hummingbirds in particular can be something that can be interesting to photograph with flash, but it does help you to freeze motion. It does help to fill in shadows, um, but you just wanna be, you know, be cautious about using flash around wildlife, especially animals like owls that need to be able to see at night. And then, so with wildlife photography, you wanna think about, um, you know, there's some aspects of wildlife photography that are just gonna help you make better photos. Um, it takes a lot of patience for certain subjects where you really need to spend some time and really sit and watch the animal and see what kind of, do they have a favorite rock? Pikas in particular, as they gather their, their um, grasses and plants and flowers, as they make a cash piles that they feed off of in the winter, um, they spend the whole summer gathering these. But as they go, they grab a whole bunch of, of plants, usually before they run back to their den or nest area, they'll have a rock that they like to stop on. They'll kind of look around and they'll make sure it's safe to, get, safe to run back. Um, find where that rock is and pre-focus on it. So by understanding that behavior, you can then capture, um, maybe you capture the, the, the pica jumping onto the rock or you capture the pica jumping off the rock and you can catch that mid-air image. Um, so understanding that behavior. And then you really just have to enjoy the outdoors. You have to enjoy being, you might need to spend a lot of time in the cold. So get really good clothing. Um, I actually just recently wrote a blog post about exactly that, that if you're gonna be outdoors photographing in the cold, um, I have a blog post about the different gear that I use for, for that. It doesn't even talk about camera gear, but just you know, gloves and hats, that kind of thing. Um, understanding animal behavior helps improve photos. Um, so taking a bird from just, you know, a, a bald eagle sitting on a, a concrete wall, which might have, a, you know, a purpose. Again, I've left a lot of negative space in here that could be used for an editorial purpose. You know, a portrait of a bird, we all like. These are great photos. Sometimes you can get really animated um, expressions on the animals. But beyond that, think about what else you can do. Um, you know, this was a polar, this, not a polar bear, a brown bear that was nicknamed Plunger. This was how he hunted fish. This is how he caught fish. And by knowing that, I watched his behavior and determined, you know, which direction does he tend to like to go? What spot does he like to, to um, kind of leap off of? And by doing that, I was pre-focused on the feet. I love the, the foot pads here. You know, it just, I, he was just absolutely hysterical. This is how he hunt, he hunted. I don't think he was very successful at it, but that was his, you know, it creates a comical photo. Um, a roseate spoonbill, again, that backlighting, this is, you know, the sun's, the sun is, the, the spoonbill is between me and the sun, so I can get that illumination on the feathers, but I watched where it was flying into the rookery um, and just kind of kept tracking with it, and I would wait, you know, which way are they coming in, which way are they flying out, where are they going once they get in there, and try to anticipate some of those behaviors and those will help you capture some of those those photographs that you're looking for. This is another example. This is a bald eagle. He does have a fish in its talon, so he's actually taking off with it. But I had been, I spent the whole day at this lake with these bald eagles. There had been a fish kill, fish kill, which is what um, sometimes happens here in Colorado, is that you know as we get into March and the temperatures start to warm up and the ponds start to thaw out, we might get, um, and I'm hoping it'll happen this year, we've had some really cold temperatures this year, we might have a, um, like a sub, you know, a crazy Arctic drop in temperatures. You know, we get this really cold overnight and it'll almost like flash freeze the water and it'll kill fish. Um, they're just not prepared for it. And usually what'll happen is the next morning, a lot of times any of the birds that eat the fit, eat fish, um, bald eagles in particular, um, as those fish rise to the surface, they might create a little ripple on the surface. And that's what I was looking for. I wasn't actually tracking with the eagle. I was looking for where was it gonna catch the bird in the water? And that was what I pre-focused on. And sure enough, he came in, grabbed that fish and took off with it. Um, the other thing is that eagles always poo before they, they fly. They don't always fly after pooing, but if you see them poo, be ready for them to, if you want to get that takeoff shot or a flight shot of them. That's a real good behavior to help help you photograph them. 
And then just consider what you want to photograph. You know, this is the same exact box, same exact day, same exact um, time. I mean, this, these photos were, only, were taken within a few minutes of each other. But these top two images, you can see the background is where the light is. Um, the, the fox is in the shade. On this top left one, you can only see three legs, which kind of bothers me. Um, whereas I waited till the fox came out you know, a nice clean background. There's not trees in the background. There's, um, not, there's no distractions back here. The fox is now standing in the light. I can see all four legs. So think about that and think of, you know, rather than just taking a whole bunch of photos that you have to go through later, really think about it when you're out in the field of, I don't wanna take this, this frame because it's just not what I want. I know the background's not good. I know the, the lighting's not right. Wait for those situations so that you can improve that photograph. This is another example of the same thing. This is a bull elk standing in a field, great light, really nice bull elk. He had, um, these are somewhat atypical antlers. Um, but it's not the most exciting photograph in the world. This is that same elk. Now he's moving. So by having a leg lifted, you can actually get a feeling of movement. I've given him some space to walk into the frame. But again, it, you know, it certainly clarifies that there's some action happening, but it's not super exciting action. Um, this is what typically most people want to photograph when they come to Rocky in the fall. Um, you know, they want to photograph the elk bugle, a big bull elk. Um, you know, just giving out all those animated aspects of the fall rut, um, the bugle, the, the sparring, the antlers, you know, all those kinds of sounds. Um, so those are the things you want to want to look for. So this is um, kind of some of the gear that I'm that I use. You want to use for wildlife photography, use the longest lens that you can afford. The 500 and 600 millimeter lenses are expensive. Um, I'm, the 500 that I have is, gosh, I think it's 10 years old now at this point. Um, but it, if you buy good glass, good glass will last you a long time. It's where you should make the investment in your camera gear. Um, camera bodies kind of come and go a lot faster than the lenses do. But um, but good glass is expensive. So I have a 500 millimeter lens. Um, I also do have an 80 to 400 millimeter lens that I use a lot for wildlife. The 150 to 600s that are out now from Tamron and Sigma are phenomenal lenses. Um, they really improve the quality of them and it gives you that versatility of being able to zoom a little bit more. Um, tele teleconverters can extend the reach of your lens. Um, with cameras switching from, so I have a 1.4 and a two point teleconverter. Um, so it'll take a, my 500 and it takes it up to a 700 millimeter when I use the 1.4. What it, it, what I'm starting to run into now is that my 1.4 actually needs to, needs to have some repairs done on it and you can no longer buy it. So I need to replace it, but if I, but you can't buy the 1.4 for the Z series yet. It's just out of stock. They, they can't seem to make them fast enough for what what they sell them for. Um, so I have a 2X that will work on my 500, but it's not terribly sharp. Um, but it, I can get the 2X on the Z9, but that doesn't work on my 500 with it, the adapter that works on the Z9. So, so we're starting to kind of have that situation happen a little bit. So you need to make sure that the teleconverter will actually be compatible with the lens. Sometimes if you use a, a zoom lens with a teleconverter, you lose the autofocus, so you have to manually focus. So that's something to consider when you're looking at, the, at, looking at purchasing one of those. Um, and I always keep a second lens in the, in the mid-zoom range, mid range. So I mentioned that I have that 80 to 400, which I use quite a bit for wildlife photography. Um, a carbon fiber tripod, the carbon fiber makes it stronger and lighter. Um, and then a gimbal head on the top. I use a Wimberly gimbal head that gives you basically a, like a 360 degree movement. Um, I use a Tragopan blind. I actually have two of them. I have one that, that I can lay down on in the ground. And then I have um, a one person, you kind of almost looks like a hunting blind, but the Tragopans actually are designed for photographers. So they have some really neat um, features in them where they can actually, you know, they have whole openings for the legs of the tripod. So you don't have to have tripod opened up all the way inside the, um, it has screens on it, it has drawstring blinds, all kinds of cool stuff on them. For low angle shots, I use a skimmer pod. That's what this is here. It's basically, it looks like a little frying pan 
Um, and then I have an adapter on it that can then hold the foot of my 500 millimeter lens. Um, I do have a set of waders. This is my rain jacket. Um, I actually have two sets of waders. I have one that's a set of neoprene so that I can lay down snow and ice. And then this is my regular, these are my summer waders that are a little bit, little bit thinner. I use them a lot for bird photography. We, um, I use them when I'm photographing brown bears up in Alaska. I actually use them a lot when I just want to kind of slosh through marshes or riverbeds or anything like that, because then I don't have to worry about getting my clothes underneath. I can just take the waders off and everything's dry underneath. And then for your clothes, oh, for you want to use a fast camera body. So we did talk about that already. I use the, I have a Z9. And I also still use my D850, um, which is my preference, my preferable lens for, or my preferable body for my wild um, landscape photography. And then for clothing, you want to make sure you're using um, quiet fabrics and really natural colors. I do believe animals know that we're there most of the time, but if you can kind of break up your, your, frame when you're sitting out there, um, it can help to get animals to kind of stop thinking about you being there. I've seen people out there with hats on that have, you know, all kinds of bling on it or bright red shirts or bright orange jackets. And it really, it can be not only distracting for other people, you know, if they're trying to take a, a landscape photo, then they've got this person walking through with an orange jacket on. Um, but it can also kind of catch the eye of animals too, that you may not always want to have happen. So here's my final thought for you. The most compelling photographs you take begin with the things about which you're most passionate and most curious. This goes back to my early slides where I talked about it was um, wildlife photography really was a way for me to combine everything that I just feel really passionate about. And by doing that, I really found that my, my photographs actually improved. Um, you know, I was willing to, to sit out there and wait for certain action. I was willing to learn as much as I can about animals, um, you know, kind of narrowing it down to certain species that I'm a little bit more interested in than others. Um, so it really is a, a big part of, of wildlife photography. And I'm gonna run through real quick some of the things that I have coming up. Um, this is an ebook that I, ha I have published. Um, I have a second edition that I updated last year. Um, I have a couple other eBooks that I'm working on right now that I hope to have done this winter. Um, but sign up for my mailing list. You can do that on my website and you can get um, some of the latest information, um, links to different blog posts and stuff that I do. I do have a new book coming out next month um, called 100 Things to Do in Estes Park. Um, that's all about um, not only the photography aspects of where to go within the park, but also, um, you know, where to go to eat and drink or where to go for um, really good history. We have an amazing history in Estes Park, um, where to shop, stuff like that. So that'll be out March 15th. I have a polar bear tour that I do every November. Um, I believe these are gonna be the dates for this year. We haven't finalized them yet, but I will be finalizing that this week. Um, so I'm going back up to Churchill in November. I go to Lake Clark every year. Um, this year sold out. I'm working on dates for next year, as well as um, potentially a new location. Uh, I've got a couple places I want to kind of scout out for some different different type of photography. I've been going up here, gosh, for I think I've been. I think this year's trip is going to be my 14th trip up there. I've been going there for 10 years now, so um, not bored of it by any means. But I was looking for something a little bit different. I am a guide for wild side nature tours, so I am headed to Peru in a couple of weeks for an Amazon riverboat tour. I know there are a couple of spots still left on that if you want a last minute trip to photograph birds and primates. Um, we are doing a Big Bend night photography workshop in July. We have a Yellowstone in winter uh, workshop in January and then Galapagos next September, which should be a pretty phenomenal trip. And then I am working with another photographer um, on a South Africa trip next August. Um, so zebras, elephants, giraffes, lions. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty sweet trip with a couple of really unique aspects to that. Um, I do give private tours in Rocky Mountain National Park from May to October if you're ever out in Colorado and are interested in learning more about the park. Um, I do show people around there. I'm doing private tours in Louisiana in April. Um, for shorebirds, these are all custom. Um, so we could go, I have places for rookeries, shorebirds, songbirds, um, so we can customize it based on what you want to photograph. Um, I am doing private photo tours, photograph bald eagles in Washington in May. Um, same thing with shorebirds in New York in June. 
um, night photography in Rocky Mountain National Park. I can do um, tours specifically just for night photography. I already mentioned Big Bend. And then for women, I and another photographer are actually partnering up. We're doing um, in June, we're going to do Devil's, we're going to be in Devil's Tower, which is, if you've ever seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that's um, that's that monolith that's in that movie. Um, but we're going to do a night workshop up there when the Milky Way is pretty close to um, to the, to uh, Devil's Tower. And then I have a bunch of things that I'm in the process of working on. I want to do fall colors in Cuyahoga National Park, um, Bosque del Apache for birds, bald eagles and hanes. Um, so sign up for the newsletter, keep an eye out on my website for um, those things that are coming up. Um, Nancy mentioned Nampa earlier. If you're not already a member, I would suggest joining Nampa. We did just join forces with ASMP. Um, we are now not one organization, but we are a partner organization. Um, so that members of both organizations now have all member benefits for, from both groups. Um, so that's, that's a pretty unique aspect. Um, and then we have a, our biannual summits coming up in Tucson in May, and that should be a lot of fun. So uh, check them out at nampa.org. And then this is my contact information. Um, Instagram and Facebook are probably my most consistent places. My articles go up a lot on Twitter um, and then my website and my, my email address. So that's all my contact information for you. So it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, Nancy, did you wanna go through those? If you'd like, I sure could. <clears throat> a lot of them are actually, uh, thanks for a great talk. So let me get up to the top here. <laughs> I love that first comment about doing friends wedding photography. Oh, yeah, yeah. I noticed yeah, that I one. Think, <clears throat> yeah, I think we've all done that. Yeah. Um, so Sue Young says, terrific presentation. Holly, thanks for an enjoyable talk. Consuelo, thanks for the presentation. Good tips. Eileen, thanks for a terrific presentation. So you did ask answer a lot of questions within the presentation itself. Ellen Rubin, thanks. You covered a very wide range of topics so well. Uh, in Trachtenberg, wonderful presentation. Okay, am I down? Whoops. What happened there? I think that was it. Is that possible? Uh, let me go back to chat. Oh, it looks like it. Yeah, my chat disappeared. So if anybody is uh, have a question still hanging in the air, share it with us. And oh, okay. If not, I just want to make an announcement. Is that you, Mary? Kevin's asking, I keep a custom dial for exposure compensation. Do you adjust? Um, I, oh, there it is. I, I do if I'm photographing an aperture. I believe um, it exposure compensation doesn't work in manual. So because I, I photograph mostly in manual, it doesn't work as, as much as I would like it to. Um, where I do really use it is when I'm out photographing in snow. I find exposure compensation helps in that situation. I use it when I'm in manual, but auto ISO, you can use compensation. Yeah, you can use it in that setting. Yep. That, that's what I tend to do. Um, okay, guys. What I did want to say is that as a group, we have very few people at the top doing all of the work. And as much as we've enjoyed doing it for the last two years, <clears throat> we are looking seriously for help. <laughs> so we're going to be sending out an email shortly, in the next couple of weeks which is gonna describe the different uh, items that we could use real significant help on. And we're hoping you guys will respond. Our other attempts at getting volunteers before kind of didn't work out very well. We did the chat and it turned out it didn't record. So we didn't have those records. So we're gonna do it a little more formally with an email. We're gonna work on the different things that we need help with. And hopefully we'll get some people to, to help divide and conquer some of the elements that we have to do. And it'll also enable us to maybe expand and do some additional things. So other than that, that's our evening, I believe. Dawn, thank you so much for a great presentation. You are very welcome. Thank you for a, having me. Yeah, it was great meeting you. 
and um, appreciate it. Maybe we'll catch one of your other presentations in our next season. Yeah, so yeah, definitely let me know. I definitely will. All right, my dear. And good night, everybody. Thank you for attending. You are a great audience and we'll see you next month. Okay. Bye. Have fun. Bye.